Uh, the Jewish community has come to call the six million that died in the Holocaust uh, what in Hebrew is called Kedoshim, or in Kedoshim in another way of pronouncing it, something like the Christian uh, meaning of saints. In other words, people who died um, as martyrs. And therefore, the category uh, that we have come to sort of understand uh, those who died in the Holocaust is one of martyrdom. Martyrdom, of course, classically means someone who dies for their religion. And for that reason, I think it's obvious sort of why I picked this topic, to look at you know, how the Jewish tradition has conceptualized martyrdom and why it is that someone who dies for his religion is considered a martyr, even if it doesn't fit maybe some more classic uh, definitions of uh, what a martyr is. So that's sort of what the substance of what I talk about. But I want to have like a secondary agenda here, which is not just the substance, but the form. And what we're going to do, this is going to be a little untraditional for an academic talk. It's going to be more, uh, top, uh, is we're going to study a passage or a series of passages from the Babylonian Talmud. The Babylonian Talmud is like the central document of the rabbinic tradition. It's this sort of huge mishmash of Jewish law, Jewish lore, thought, stories, anecdotes. We'll sort of see a little bit of that. Um, and one of the things that I've been working in my research is sort of how this document does a whole bunch of different things in Jewish culture. It both sets the laws, but it's also the place where we work out ideas, where we sort of learn how to think about things. And what I'd like to do here is sort of uh, demonstrate that. Now, the reason I think there's a good match here, and we'll see a little video about this in a second, is that from an internal Jewish perspective, the Holocaust, of course, was the single greatest threat to Jewish identity and Jewish continuity. Um, and it really brackets a thousand years of European anti-Semitism, starting with the Crusades, which we'll talk about, and really ending in Auschwitz. Uh, there, were, there are many, of course, responses to that, and, and who, some level, who knows how to respond to this. But one of the things that, at least in, in the Orthodox Judaism, has come, has come to respond to it is that if, if that was the greatest threat to the sort of identity and the continuity of Judaism, the response to that has been a really refocus on the basic document of the Jewish tradition, of the rabbinic tradition, the Talmud. And I want to reference here, I'm going to show a quick video of it, um, just how this works and sort of why I want to bring these two things together. Um, about six weeks ago, in, in New York, in MetLife Stadium, or Giant Stadium, or some weeks it's Jet Stadium, uh, almost 100,000 people gathered, um, or mainly Orthodox Jews, to celebrate the completion of the seven and a half year cycle of the daily study of a page of Talmud. Now, I looked around for some videos that would capture this. I honestly couldn't find anyone I loved. So this is from like a newscast in a, in a New York uh, sort of media market. But I think that it will give you a little bit of a flavor of sort of the centrality of this and why this is sort of a response to the Holocaust. In fact, that at this gathering, they really dedicated, although it doesn't show up in this video, they really dedicated it to the memory uh, of the six million martyrs. So there's a chance this might actually work. Nine out of ten times that these things are working. It was. 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 It was
doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. Un yeah. Unplug it from the jack and see whether it's coming out of the computer. Yeah. Unplug the jack and see what's coming out of the computer. Then we know it's yeah. then we know it's here. It's it's on this end then. It's the technology here, yeah. not your computer. It's not the computer. You no, know, it's it's something that's gone. Is there a volume control for the? Is it falling asleep? It's, they, they sometimes fall asleep. Okay. okay. That's it. Yeah. Right. Let's, let's just do. Let's just do a little bit of. There we go. Sorry. We have been talking up until now about asbestos. We had uh, the sun isn't even up yet when Jacob Schleiner settles behind a desk in a study room at Benai Shuren Synagogue in Teaneck. He's not a rabbi here or a teacher. He's a finance guy working at Standard and Poor's. But today, he's leading a group of men in a tradition that has been handed down in the Jewish community for millennia, the study of the Talmud. So let's just do, let's just do a little bit of the tosis. Um, not gonna do the whole tosis. So gosh, so in the- This is daf yomi. It means a page a day. And that's what these men do, along with hundreds of thousands of others around the world. Each day, they study one page of the Talmud a collection of interpretations of Jewish laws and traditions. But because the text is 2,711 pages long, it takes more than seven and a half years to complete. You figure, you know, a page a day, you know, an hour a day you could spare on something like this. You don't view it as that I have 2,711 pages to go on so <laughs> one day at a time. You just view it page by page by page, and then it becomes doable. The key is that everyone is studying the same page at the same time. Elliot Gelman is doing the daf for the first time. It's amazing that you've got uh, disparate groups across the world, from very religious to uh, not, not so religious, that are all doing the same thing at the same speed, at the same cycle. And no matter where you go, you can pick it up and uh, you know be, you know, as they say, on the same page with them. It's almost like a, a, a mark of pride, you know, you walk into whatever synagogue it is, whatever shul you happen to walk into, you just ask them, what time is the daf? For this group. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> right, I think we're going to fail on this. You may have to play again, because uh, the arrows, the play arrows fly. You're right, I mean, the idea that we should play the whole video is just... Uh, <laughs> yeah. We just refresh and then we refresh and we just refresh. Just to play button with the time, right? We've been talking up. Ooh, it's five thirty in the morning. They meet for an hour, perform their morning prayers, and then head out to their everyday lives. There are probably only two or three that are actually you know, learning full time. That that's their 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 rabbis, and that they do it. Almost everybody else, you know, has has a real job. You know, they're, uh, they're doctors, they're lawyers, they're accountants. They leave their job. Has work. A real job. A real job. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And, you know, and they find time to be able to prepare and get ready for to you. Today, so this there are so advice. many distractions. So much to occupy one's time, so much out there that dazzles the eye and the imagination. And yet, people will rise at 5 a.m. or begin at 11 p.m. To do what? To study a text written more than 1,500 years ago in a difficult language, which is intellectually challenging with many arcane subjects. On Wednesday, some 100,000 people gather at MetLife Stadium to celebrate the completion of the current cycle. Together, they read the final lines of the final page of the Talmud before breaking out in song and dance. But studying the Talmud is never complete. Jacob has completed his fourth cycle. And the next morning at 5.30, we'll be here starting Volume one, page one. Okay, so I think that just tries to give some uh, color to the role that um, the Talmud plays in the uh, in the Jewish tradition, and why um, why they dedicated that uh, 
to the six million because the view is, and it's one that I share, that that is a response, right? That, that, that 60 years or 65 years after Auschwitz, to have 100,000 people show up in a football stadium to celebrate a book that's hard, old, recondite, all those things, um, is really sort of a remarkable uh, feature. And, and I think is the, the, the Jewish community, a part of the Jewish community's internal uh, response to sort of like the conscious uh, of the Holocaust. So with that sort of background, I want to sort of dive in and sort of do a little model lesson of what this is. Because in Judaism, the act of Torah study, particularly in the Talmud, is not just what lawyers do. As you saw, right, this is something that everybody does. It's really deemed to be an act of worship uh, and what you might call communion in as much as it's an act of sort of finding out what the law is or an intellectual activity. It's really all of the above. And I thought that the best way, rather than talk about it, is just to do it, and to do it on a subject that's sort of relevant to what we're talking about, this question uh, of martyrdom. So, now when we think about martyrdom, right, it sounds medieval, saints, right, this fortunately is not part of our daily existence. But if you think about it, every culture has to decide what it's willing to die for, right? What values are more important than life itself, right? Our culture does it. We send people to war. They're we don't know who, but we know some of them are going to die. Right? That's a decision saying that whatever that value is, right, that's more important than life itself. Policemen, firefighters, right? there's a whole bunch of places in our society where, despite the fact that we always say life is the most important thing, that's actually uh, not true. So what I want to do is focus on that place in the Talmud where it discusses um, how it thinks about this. And we're going to sort of do what I think you have to do, Talmud, sort of reverse engineer sort of from this very compact sort of language, what the ideas are behind it. We're going to kind of model how it is that the thing is traditionally studied. So let's start here, and I broke it down for you. Uh, so this, just to give you an idea, this is roughly, two, the text we'll do today is roughly two-thirds of a page of Talmud. So this would be like the equivalent of like one of the morning sessions, although they do it uh, obviously different. Um, are there any more running around? So, um, so I'll read, and then we'll try to like get it. All right. So, like a little background: the Talmud is a composite work, and we'll see that it's it's written like in a bunch of different layers, and that's one of the hard things about studying is you never know who's talking. Uh, and it incorporates material written from like as early as the second, late first, early second century, you know, just when the Gospels are coming together to give you a sort of time frame, uh, all the way up until the seventh and eighth century. So it covers a long time. Uh, and we'll see, it's, it's a layered kind of document. So this actually first bit in, in section A is, is probably from the very late first century. And we have a report that they voted and concluded in the attic of Mitzana of Lod. All right, so they gathered in some place there. And they said as follows, for all sins in the Torah, if one is threatened to transgress rather than be killed, he should transgress rather than die. All right, so here's the basic rule. The basic rule is, Right, that any time there is a Torah commandment, right, a religious commandment called a mitzvah, um, and that sort of is going to threaten your life, either because of the facts of it will, for instance, you're really, really hungry and the only food is non kosher, or to kind of riff on the story in the New Testament, right, you're stuck in a pit and it's the Sabbath, right, or that someone comes and forces you to do that. So generally, the rule is you transgress and don't endanger life. But there are three exceptions, right? Except for the cases of the worship of foreign deities, uh, sexual transgressions, and murder. Right? That seems to be the basic rule. So like, let's try to think, like, what's, what's that telling you? What, what's, what's, what are those exceptions about? Why are they exceptions? What's the rationale or the statement being made behind the law. Because one of the things that typifies the Talmud is that the law is just like the, the surface for the kind of whole discussion that's going to be the back end of that, which we'll get into. Why those three? Now we can ask, is it three as a unit or three separate things that happen to come together, right? You can, yeah. They're all the same kind. 
Oh, I didn't mean that. I was saying, like, is, yeah. there, is there a unity well, between them? <laughs> right. you, could, you could go that so, yeah. so what, I'm not going to talk the whole time. Yeah. Um, it goes against the first two commandments, to uh, follow God. That, that comes in hand with worshiping foreign deities. Okay. And the second one, uh, loving your neighbors where sexual transgressions can uh, hurt your relationship with your neighbors, mm. and murder, which also hurts your relationship with yeah, I would say. Okay, so one view is that, right, assuming Ten Commandments are some very important subset, um, so false gods, right, would be the extreme of, of that. Murder would be the extreme of the sort of man-to-man. Sex transgressions, I think the way you, you did it is sort of right, because it's actually not all of them, it's only certain ones, ones that tend to harm other people. We're going to sort of bracket that. Um, so maybe that's the idea. Maybe like, so we might say severity. Right? And if you know anything about the Old Testament, right, uh, the later prophets, like, why is the temple destroyed? Right? It says, because you're a bunch of idolaters, adulterers, and murderers. Right? So that's the sort of view that, okay, these things are so severe, right, so bad, that they break the general rule. And isn't there some sort of implication that they're irreversible? That other transgressions can be reversed over time or through. Um I'm uh, doing a, a bath, you know, like over time thing. But these, especially with murder, uh, murder is irreversible. It's irreversible. If you read that backwards, that means that worship of a foreign deity is irreversible. As with a, a sexual transgression, is the same way. It's irreversible. You right. can't undo it once it's done. Okay. Which I don't know whether you can go that far. Whether this is more of a commentary about idolatry. Well, we're going to get to that. I mean, that, that's yeah. definitely the place to go because to some degree, like you're all pointing and, and the, you're going to see that Tom is going to focus largely on idolatry because that's kind of the hardest case. Right. Or I'm going to see he's going to deal with murder a little bit too. But, but that's right. That's sort of the test case and we'll see that that's where a lot of the discussion goes. All right, so let's now kind of look at the next section, which I'll put up. And in classic Talmudic fashion, um, as soon as somebody says something, someone else is going to disagree. And the Talmud says it's fine. But is this really the law with respect to foreign worship? Have we not learned in the name of Rabbi Ishmael? And now, we can watch that layer text, right? In other words, that's a voice that's not going to quote something. And I broke it down, well, on the sheets that came up. I kind of uh, broke it down, but of course, in the thing itself, is just all running together. So he has the following teaching. From where do we know that if someone is threatened to worship a foreign deity or else be killed, that he should transgress rather than die? Because the verse Leviticus says, you should keep my decrees and laws that man should carry out and live by them. And he says, what are the goals of the decrees and laws to live by them and not to die by them? So he kind of has a reading of the verse. But then he has a coda. And he says, I might think that this rule applies even in public. But therefore the verse teaches, you shall not desecrate my holy name, and I shall be sanctified amongst the congregation of Israel. All right, so let's focus on what the rule is here. What's he saying that's different than the first year? Right, remember, the first view was you, you can sin, right, rather than die for everything except for, we'll call them the big three. Right? Murder, idolatry, uh, adultery, idolatry. Now, this is different. And he says, first, he says, look, the point of the commandments is to live. Right? Man should live by them. And he says, therefore, life takes precedence. But then he has a kind of exception. What's his exception? Yes. Sorry? I heard someone mumble something. The desecration, the idea of sanctifying, it's, it has a communitarian, uh, uh, it's not just about, it's the public versus private. Yeah, uh, right, thing. there's a whole different dimension yeah. that comes in here. It's about, it's not so much about the, the core sin, <coughs> right, that's kind of not his concern. It's about the public perception, right, right? and therefore he says, I might think that this rule even applies in public. There's... The Talmud kind of has this conversing sort of way, so you really have to kind of flip it around and say, this rule only applies in private. Meaning, in a private context, you always choose life. Right. But if it's public, then we've got another issue. We've got this issue of sanctification and desecration, which is not exactly the same thing 
as the underlying sin. This is a very different image. Right? This one is concerned not so much about the person and the sin and how he's going to relate to that. Not a kind of internal dialogue, but a very external dialogue. What's it going to look like? How are people going to react? What message does it send? So let's sort of drill down a little bit into kind of what might be a more philosophical uh, difference between these two views. The Tom will help us out a little, but let's try to set the stage. What, what might be kind of motivating this? Or what are the different kind of theories embedded in something that looks at the severity of the sin versus something that looks at the kind of performance of it? I mean, are you talking in terms of ethics? Like a, a kinds of situational ethics, a, a sort of absolute quality, a sort of that, those vertical those uh, trajectories about the relationship between the individual and God, as opposed to the individual and their community? That, I mean, I think there's many possibilities. I mean, yeah. th this is exactly the question, right? So right. if you're a classic Tal Talmudic leader here, you're going to say, okay, what are they, what's the debate here? What's the argument about this? Right? And it's very, it's both closed and open. Right? So I think, or one possibility is, I mean, Let's, let's sort of go back to this idea of dying for a cause. Right? And you can imagine sort of two very different approaches to that. You could see it as a sort of pinnacle of the commitment to the cause. Right? I think in Christian martyrology, mm -hmm. and I'll talk here before people know a lot more about this than I do, like there's, there's definitely a strong trend of that. So sort of like the epitome of worship is to die for the cause. Right? When someone dies in a war, Right? You can see that, especially post hoc, there's a lot of this talk of like, that that process is almost like a beautiful thing. Right? Think Romeo and Juliet. Right? They die, and it's love for each other, and it's an act of love that sort of shows that you've transcended yourself, <coughs> and you're sort of willing to give up everything. Right? It's a sort of internal, ecstatic sort of perspective. Right? That's sort of one view of the world. Another view of the world can say, I would say something much more pragmatic, much more, look, sometimes you're pushed to a wall, and sometimes you got to do this, right? That sometimes, like, it's necessary, but it's hardly something that we look forward to. It's not something that we sort of celebrate as an ideal, right? It's a sort of necessary cost. I, I thought about, is it, is it um, celebration or resignation? Maybe wait a minute, right? Is, is when someone dies for a cause, is that a celebrated act? Or you resign to the circumstances and you say, look, this is what it is. Not that it's not the right thing to do, right? This is all separate discussion. Mm -hmm. It's the right thing to do, but the attitude you take toward it is, is a very different one. And I think that's what's going on here, and let me tell you why, right? The one who kind of looks at it as very, and we'll see this, right? The more you think of it as a sort of public act, well, let's think about this. What does it mean, public? Let's try to reverse engineer the facts that bring up to a public test of faith. Right? Clearly, and we'll see this in the Talmud, right? somebody, some, we'll call it government, right, is coming in, or somebody with guns or swords or something like that, is coming in and trying to make a public spectacle of testing. Right? And why do you do that? Well, they're trying to disrupt the sort of communal order, right? They're trying to say that this isn't that serious. This is something, right? That's the point. And then, if the person martyrs, right, or gives himself up, it's actually, if you think about it, it's a judo move, right? At one moment, the we'll call him the oppressor, because that's how the Talmud will talk about it, has all the power, right? He's sitting there with his, you know, knights or whatever, and sort of, you know gathered around everybody watching, are you going to do this or not? But the second the person is willing to die for the cause, right, he flips the whole thing upside down. Because now, right, in some sense, he has all the power. The martyr has all the power. Right, because he sort of says, well, look, I don't care what you do to me. I thought a great example of this was the guy who right, burned himself and started the Arab Spring. Now, you can debate here from tomorrow 
what caused the Arab Spring, but clearly, right, the fact that this guy was just said, right, so he sort of flipped the, and literally flipped the whole uh, regime upside down, right? That, I would say, can, this is, but, but you can see that as sort of a resignation to facts, right? Look, these are the facts, this is what's part of human rights law, right? A very different one is to think of this, maybe, maybe in the popular culture, quasi-popular culture, that Romeo and Juliet sort of analogy, right? Because we think dying for God is a kind of abstract thing, but, but what love means, right, is to sort of, at, at its extreme, right, is to see yourself as sort of totally merged in the other. So why do I think that? Because let's look at the very next line. So what did the Talmud do, right? It set a rule, and I said, wait a minute, is that the rule? Right? The rule seems to be something else. Not about the severity, but about the circumstance. And that's going to resolve that. It says, you're right, but there's a different theory behind it. And it says like this. Rather, right, the law taught in the attic, right, the first rule, right, follows the opinion of Rabbi Eliezer, who cites the verse, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, heart, or soul. You guys all know that. All your heart, heart, or soul, up to your soul. And I think it's not accidental that the motivating term here is love. Right? Let's think of other ways you could have done this. You could have said fear. Right? right? You'll burn in hell. Right? Plenty of Bible passages to support something like that. You could have said Right? Fear of retribution, enormity of the sin. Re revenge on the oppressor. Revenge on the oppressor. Yeah. Right? He could have cited any number of reasons to do this. But I think the love aspect is casting that that mode, right, the first one we saw, that the one that we'll call the attic, right, that one is sort of motivated by that kind of theory. And then the other one, and we'll see this play out, is, is much less about a kind of ecstatic internal experience of what it means to give yourself up for something, but much more, I would say, situational, much more political in the sense that it's like a tune that there's a political dimension here, that its main concern is not the intensity of, of a sin, but like why someone else wants me to do this. And therefore, it's gonna pay much more attention to that, as we'll see. Yeah. Then what, how much effort do you make, if that's true, if you can display your love for God by giving up your soul, I, there's problems with soul. Like, does, do you lose your soul when you when your physical body dies? I mean, it's implied that you lose your soul, right? He you, you, um, demands your soul. That's not a. I know that's not what the sort of body soul dichotomy that we. No, I think it, I think it's it, well. Look, the word in Hebrew is it's not clear that it's soul, right? It's, oh, okay. It's, that's what it's, it means translated that way. Okay. But in Hebrew, it's not so clear what it is, and but, I think that's what they're bothered by, like. What's the difference right. between these two? But, but then I, that was actually my point. Is that do you, would you ever, if you saw an opportunity to express that love, okay, we'll get do it. you walk through that door or do you do everything possible to keep it out of the public realm? And that's gonna absolutely. Be, and that's going to be exactly the debate. And we'll see right. that. Um, so, sorry, your name? Uh, Tim. So Tim is, I think, taking us in exactly that direction. right? Because I think that's one of the big differences. right? Do you search for opportunities to do this? Or if you're pushing to a quarter, is this the response? And we're going to see that this debate in Talmud, and later right, in the medieval period, this goes from being a text that you study to something that happens actually, and that debate mm -hmm. uh, reemerges precisely. Now, remember, it's now looking from the source, and I think this is really a little bit of a side. But all right, so the source for the the remember we had three, right? We had we had the false gods, we had the murder, and we had the adultery. It's not exactly adultery, so we'll just call it that. Um, and then it says, what's the source of the law regarding murder? And the Talmud quotes uh, the following. This is source uh, C on your page. I'm sorry, source D. And it says, all right, so you told us the reason for the false gods is this idea of love. Uh, what about murder? And it says, well, that's based on reason. And it demonstrates it with the following case. A man came before Rabba. Rabba is a rabbi who lives in 4th century Babylonia, one of the kind of dominant figures in the Talmud. And he says, I was threatened. And somebody said, I either have to kill this guy or I'm going to be killed. And Rabba responds to him, be killed, but do not kill. For who said that your blood is redder than his blood? Perhaps his blood is redder than yours. Now, this is actually very similar to the kind of Kantian imperative, right? The categorical imperative. It says that you can't make uh, 
uh, you know, inter-life uh, valuations. And what emerges from here is a principle of passivity. All right, in other words, so that the answer is, well, it seems to, right? So if he's going to kill you, he's going to kill you, but you don't kill someone else. But I want to focus here, not so much on the content, but on the form. Remember, what's going on here is a sort of articulation of the three, you know, the big three, right? The three things that are so severe that you have to give your life for. And I think it's very interesting how the Talmud derives them. How do we derive the first one? What kind of reasoning do you use? Right, this was the how do you have to die? Well, we quoted a verse, right? And we used a kind of scriptural authority reasoning, right? We might say a revelation-based reasoning. What kind of reasoning is on display here? <coughs> Well, it says reason, but is it reason? That's the word. It's, well, that's a way to translate that word. Yeah. But look, there's clearly no scriptural authority, no. right? There's maybe this is like a little aphorism, right? That kind of captures a certain thing that Kant would later spit on. I mean, this is very, you know, I think what you know, I think we call this reason. I don't want to get to whether it's natural law or not. <laughs> I mean, we can debate that. But I think it's very interesting that the construction of what the foundations of the faith are are really, and I think somewhat deliberately, pulled from two very different places, right? One, a rather simple, or, or, so simple direct right, um, response to a scriptural imperative, a revelation. And then another one, right, the polar opposite, right, the Talmud, event, right? Um, something that, that, you know, means nothing of that sort of revelatory um, logic to come up with. And that's why I said that when we think of those three, are they are they are they a category or are they three separate incidents? Right? And what I was getting to is sort of like, how do we come with those three? Are those three independently derived or is there one thing that sort of forms them? And I think it's not by accident that the Talmud wants to derive them from two completely polar sources. Right? To sort of say that if you want to understand the fundamentals of faith, you gotta understand, right? Something not so different what appears in Christian theology. Um, that there's like the revelation side and the reason side that are sort of coming together to undergird. So okay, that's a little bit of an aside. All right, so that's just yes. Uh, is there a difference in understanding between murder and killing? Boy, that's a whole complicated uh, story. Um, why don't for, for right now, let's say, let's bracket that and we can maybe come back to it. Um, the answer is, I think it's a much stronger distinction in Christian thought than it is in Jewish thought. That's my like first pass at it. Um, there are two different uh, words, right? There's retzach, which is murder, and harov, which is killing. I'm not sure they're quite used in, in, the, in the same way. So let's just hold off on that in a second. All right, so that's sort of stage one of what happens in the Talmud. I want to go on, because we're now going to get two radical expansions and then one contraction. And we're trying to make sense of it, right? So the next stage says as follows. When Rav Dini was traveling from Israel, he said, all right, so what's happening here, just, right? There's sort of two centers, one in Israel, we're talking third, fourth, fifth century, one in what they call Babylonia, today we call that Iraq. And scholars are constantly traveling from one place to the other, sort of bringing in new teachings. And he said, that the rule was only stated in times of calm. But in times of governmental religious persecution, one must die rather than transgress even a minor misfire. And a very similar statement, and he continued, and even in times of calm, it was only stated when the threat takes place in private. But in public, one must die rather than transgress even a minor misfire. All right, so what's happening here? Bad news. All right, so it's, there's, there's pretty extreme expansion. But an expansion in which direction? Right? Notice that the whole question of severity has now dropped completely out of the picture. Right? And it's now just a function of, seems to be a holy function of, the external face, or what, what I would call the politics of it. Right? It's very much interested in not so much the thought of the 
potential martyr, right, of the believer being tested, but to some degree the thought of the tester, right, the oppressor, the government. What's the government's interest here? You know, they, don't, they don't mean government like us. They mean any sort of person who, who has, um, who can sort of force these things. Yes? I, just, I see a vast, and I probably was but I see a vast difference in the word severity between the private act, which could almost be considered a, like suicide or just a kind of glib, an undervalue of your own life, versus the society that is ruled by these rules. That cannot be. And that, you know, if a society is breaching these three basic rules, it's a lot different than if a person that's, it's a lot. Okay, I think this serious. is really helpful. So, so try, tell me again. I think the severity, I, I disagree, I think. I take issue with the word severity between the individual act and their, um, their being charged to spare their life for almost any reason. Okay. Versus the society that might be committing these transgressions as a society, I consider that far more severe of a transgression. You know, it, it creates an impossible society. It's much more severe. You can't have a society that is raping and murdering. Sure. And, and so, therefore, that that just trumps it, and that you have to back that. Sure. That's, so but, but then that's what martyrdom is. You know, martyrdom, you're, you're not dying in private. You're dying for, for the larger. You know. Okay, no, so I agree with that. I'm not sure we disagree. I'm not even um, sure. Um, but I, I think the, the point, what I want to point out here is that these two expansions, right, are focused less on, you know, I'll use kind of criminal law words, you know, the underlying crime, right, and more on the performative aspect of it, right, who's watching and who's demanding, right? So basically, one way to read this is like, look, the truth is anything can become an object for martyrdom if the politics, and I mean that in the sense of like, the, the way the surrounding world is going to understand that, are right. Now, it's pretty radical, right? Because it's saying even for a minor mix, but then we're not any more focused on the big three. The big three have their own rule, right? Like I said, even in private. This one is saying, but if that's the point, right? If the reason that someone is asking you to do this is to test your faith, then you've got to kind of give it. So it, it, Theologically, right, or philosophically, it's just, I think it's a very interesting point. It says, really, life always takes precedence. Unless what's being tested is your resolve to that life, in which case, the whole thing is flipped. Yeah. Yeah, and the context is always in the, uh, as the being oppressed. This is not about what, what's, how you position oneself against your own congregation. This is a setting where there's always an oppressor, and then it's about making sure that the congregation of Israel is sanctified. That's, That's right. what's at stake. That's right. Is the sanctification of the of the community. So there's always an outside oppressor which is threatening or tempting or you know they set it up so easily that that it makes it almost the oppressor could could wipe out an entire the entire congregation by just offering them a minor mitzvah to to to, to transgress it in public and if they put a foot wrong, right. you know they would sooner die than do this simple thing. It actually opens up the door to the oppressor to eliminate huge numbers of people that take this stuff seriously. Yes, and that did happen. Um, we'll, we'll get to the history of that in a second. Right. Um, that's right. I think I think everything. Sorry, you know Tim. Tim. Everything Tim's saying is right. So so this one. And look, you can hear the history here, right? Mm -hmm. That there is. I mean, in other, I would say this. This is a, in some sense, this is a. This is designed for self-preservation. It says we'll give up anything unless what you want us to give up is the very thing you're testing. Now those are the expansions, but let's look, there's now mm -hmm. a retraction. And this is going to come about in a kind of funny, tummy me way. Because they're going to ask, wait, so you just told me, right, that anything in public, you have to die for. And now they're going to come up with somebody in the Bible, who they think is very holy, who seemed to have sinned in public. And they say, wait a minute, wasn't Queen Esther transgressing in public? Now here's where it's like going to the comments differently. Well, who the, what, where, how do we get there? <laughs> Right? But they, of course, assume that you just have the kind of whole Bible in front of you. And I say, wait, what happened in the Queen Esther story, right? She is taken to Ahasuerus' palace and basically has to live as, as his queen. Um, now, is that a sexual transgression? Maybe. Um, is that, why didn't she resist? Right? If you just tell me that 
wasn't that a time of persecution? Sure, that's what the whole story is about. They wanted to kill the Jews. Why didn't she resist? Right? That's the Talmud's question. So I would say it's a kind of literary device to kind of push this sort of question. And they come up with two very different answers uh, that are very interesting. One is, this could be a whole class in itself, so we're actually going to gloss about this. Esther was passive. Now what does that mean? Is that the description of a sexual act? Is that a description of Esther particularly? Is that a state of mind? What I would want to focus on, though, is that that speaks to the person being tested, right? That some passivity or lack of action, and we'll see that this is going to reemerge in the medieval period, is an important qualifier. But the second one is actually a little bit more interesting. It says, now, Rama says, remember we heard about him before, that the law is different when the oppressor demands the transgression for his own benefit. It says, look, Ahasuerus, the king in the Purim in the Esther story, he wasn't interested in testing Esther's faith. He was interested in having her as his babe. Right? So therefore, the test of, it wasn't a test of faith. It was for his own benefit. And then he quotes the story. Look, like the guy who came and told the Jew, right, so you're not allowed to cut grass on Shabbat. You're not allowed to pick anything. This is the whole story in the New Testament with the ears of wheat. Um, so the guy says, come and cut grass on Shabbat. So if he says, give it to an animal, then you could do that. Because it would seem that the guy's motivation is to feed his cow. But if he says, throw it in the river, then he says, you should be killed rather than transgress. So what Rob is coming in and saying is, wait a minute. To the extent we're really focused on this question of an oppressor, a time of um, you know, religious persecution, Right? Then we, we ought to test very carefully right, the motivations for that. Right? Is it really religious persecution, or is it just bad government? Right? Or is it just they want their taxes? Or now, what's interesting, if you think about this as a lawyer right now, what we've done is, right, so on the one hand, the Talmud took two very large steps to expand the scope of when you need to, to, uh, to martyr but then creating this loophole that you can drive a truck through, right? Because it doesn't take much to say, oh no, that's, that's, they're just doing that for their own benefit. Right? That, that, that's not about a test of faith. Right? But I think even here you see that there's, there's again, those two angles emerge. Right? Is this about the individual person? That might be this sort of active passive thing. Or is it about how's it going to look and the motivations of the person doing it? Right? Yeah. Why should I believe that Esther was passive? Um, they tell you she is. Well, well she's, I mean, she's they tell me she is, but I mean, I can interpret no, the story. No, no, no. I mean, for the sake of the argument, that's that. all. That's so, yeah. so, okay, so. <laughs> so can we have an argument that Esther wasn't passive, but right? Sure, sure, yeah. Um, so here's how I would say it. I mean, in other words, where, where they're coming up with Esther, the way I view this is, what they're trying to say, they're basically using her to test this property. Mm -hmm. If you're going to tell me, that you always have to die anytime there is um, anytime there is a, a, a time of, of threat, right? A time of persecution. Then what about Esther, right? So now they're, I think they're thinking like, okay, what could possibly justify that? In other words, this is a construct to sort of push forth a legal argument. This is basically, I'll give you two ways. One, I could tell you that she's passive, and then the example that they bring in the Middle Ages is: suppose someone says, "I'm going to throw you on this baby." Right? And, and then the baby will die. Do you have to give up your life for that? Answer no, right? Because you're just like an object. Now, you can get to the whole sexual politics of what they think here, and this has a long history of itself. I want to bracket that and talk about it later. Um, but I think that the, the legal principle that emerges here is that there's a defensive passivity, right? And this is used, we'll see how Maimonides uses this in the 12th century. And then there's another defense of they don't really care if you're keeping your religion up. They're just interested in something else. Now, that's going to play out if they're just interested in money, right? Just pay them off. That's what they really want. They're just saying, right, if you don't bow down to, to it comes up, right? We'll talk about crusades in a second. If you don't bow down to our God, right, um, we're going to kill you. But the answer is, no, no, really, that was just a tax collection system, right? And then really what everybody knew is they were supposed to bribe the official and get out of it. I, it. Couldn't you say that Esther was smart? 
not passive in that this whole thing about the oppressor, there's a trick here because what oppressor would tell um, tell a Jew to cut grass and give it to an animal and our will kill you. It's like make a law that you have to feed you. You know, like that that doesn't reveal that the oppressor knows anything about Jewish law. But if you but if you tell them to cut the grass and throw it in the river, right. that violates Jewish law. That means the oppressor knows enough yeah. about Jewish law to be able to know when you're going to be breaking it. Exactly. And that means that's a different kind of oppressor than someone who just wants to meet their own exactly. needs. Like with Esther, yet he didn't know enough about Jewish law to know he was even tempting her, so it doesn't count. And there's a lot of so a lot of the medieval commentators are saying, are these two different answers? Or like what you just said, they're sort of reinforcing the answers. Yeah. All right, good. All right, so let's just, so, all right, so this was the Talmud, right? This thing is written, uh, comes together 5th, 6th, 7th century. And so far, this is a document that is studied, right? This is, this is kind of working out, hashing out legal ideas. Now, what happens is in the Middle Ages, uh, the Jewish community start sort of approaching the Talmud, not just as a kind of collection of legal and philosophical and theological arguments, but as a basis of practice, you know, as a sort of place where you understand what Jewish law is. And... When confronted with this and confronted with the reality, we see two very different things. And I'll lay the story. Now, the Crusades, if there's any concept that I think is just more divergent than the term in Jewish law and Christian thought, is this term Crusades. I spent this afternoon looking up you know, the Catholic Encyclopedia of Crusades. It mentions the word. So, this is not at all what Jews think about the Crusades. When you say Crusades to Jews, you say the beginning of anti Semitism. The Crusades, as they would go, particularly the First and Second Crusade, through the Rhine communities in sort of northern France, northern Germany, they basically came and said, well, the theory was, well, why are we going all the way to Palestine to worry about the infidels? What about the ones right here? And um, they killed and wrecked havoc on many, on a number of, of very important Jewish communities. Uh, and the Crusades have come to stand for, and when I say the beginning of anti-Semitism, this is debated in the scholarly literature, but essentially if you look for where's the first time the Jews are singled out as Jews? Mm -hmm. right? Most of the stuff that happens in the Bible seems to be like because they're there, right? It doesn't seem to be because they're Jews. Many people understand the Crusades is that first time in which Jews are singled out as Jews for persecution. And a view, and I would say maybe even a dominant view, a Jewish view, of European history sort of begins in the, around the year 1000 with the Crusades and ends in Auschwitz, right? And sees that as a sort of, you know, a thousand years of that history. So here's what we know about the Crusades. They come in and the communities of Northern France and Northern Germany, many of them, um, not only did they martyr themselves, they killed themselves before. And not only did they kill themselves, there are reports that they killed their children and each other rather than face the Christian soldiers who said, accept Christ. Now, what happens is, two, three generations after this, the great scholars of the Talmud, they, they've got a little bit of a problem, right? It was burned in their communal identity is that our forefathers, our did this. But then you look at the Talmud, and it doesn't say anything like that. Right, like, like Tim pointed out, Right, it says maybe, okay, in other words, maybe be killed, right? But nowhere does it say, kill yourself. And it certainly doesn't say, kill your children. Roughly the same time, let's move not from Northern Europe to Northern Africa. Community of Fez, um, we have the Almohads, the you know, Arab tri uh, Muslim tribe, who sort of conquers the area, and they too tell the Jews of Fez, you have to take the fealty oath to Muhammad, say, you know, Muhammad is the true prophet, is on this true religion, or we're going to kill you. And there, the Jews basically became what later would be known as Marauders. In other words, they all said that, yeah, 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 and then went about their lives Jewishly, somewhat underground, somewhat even above them. And in that case, there's this famous letter that Maimonides writes to this community because somebody had said, look, these guys also didn't follow the rules of the Talmud. The Talmud says in a situation like that, you've got to give up your life. They didn't. How could, how could they still function as Jews, right? Their, their, their observance of the commandments are worthless, right? They're non-Jews, they really should have been killed. 
right, they, they, they've sort of, they failed the fundamental test. Uh, they're, they, they're sort of out of bounds. And what's really interesting is that the authorities in both communities are now going to kind of like bend and twist the, to get them to match. So what do they do in Northern Europe? They basically take this train of thought and we're saying that you know, the Talmud really sets a floor, not a ceiling, right? And really the images they come up with are the binding of Isaac, right? Saul falling on his sword. Other images, which interestingly are not typically formal sources of Jewish law, and they say, and they basically take this, I would say they take this love concept, right? The idea that one should give up, right? And they say, look, you read this topic, and what is, what is the line? The line says that when the religion is under duress or under threat, you've got to give it. Yeah, so it doesn't quite fit the formal rules. I'll get some other sources for that. And they sort of go and they defend the practice that way. When it comes to the children, it's interesting. No one quite defends it. They sort of said, well, they were very holy and you know, they, they, they're not willing to quite go there. Um, so that's what happens there. Maimonides, right, so he writes this letter and he says, no, 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 you've got it wrong. He goes the other way. He says, look, and he's got a bunch of arguments. What he picks on this, this is passage. It requires some formal action. He says, a verbal declaration, eh, that's not a formal action. Is that right? Who knows? Um, he also says, look, you can't coerce faith. You can coerce an action, sort of building on this, right? So I can make you bow down. Because I can't make you believe, right? That doesn't count. Uh, he then goes to, to this point of what are they really after? And he says, these guys, they don't really care. Because he says, look, they all know that you guys are still Jewish. They don't care. They just need you to say this thing. So, so it doesn't really matter. So he takes sort of the exact opposite line. Now, see, he's stressing not so much the... Um, the martyrdom as a sort of expression of belief, but more as, you know, what can we do? We're stuck. But if you can kind of find reasons to avoid the situation, you should. And that's sort of what he counsels. So I think, like, what I find very interesting about this is I think this is a sort of Talmud playing its role. It both tells you a lot and it doesn't tell you a ton. What I mean? In some sense, it really frames the debate, right? It tells you what are the values, right? The core values are there are certain things you have to die for. Right? They're either fundamental sins, right, or when the religion is on the line. Right? So it clearly sets uh, those values out there. Um, and then it tells you what the considerations are. Right? The more the reason for being challenged is to test your faith, the more you're supposed to give it up. Right? But then it says, but also make sure that that's what's going on. But I think in not defining exactly how those two things work in practice, it also leaves, and I think the history bears this out, a lot of room for very different responses to fit within its rubric. Right? Because you can interpret this statement of Rabba very narrowly or very broadly. Right? If you interpret it very broadly like Maimonides did, there's going to be very few cases. Right, where it's actually you're going to have, you're able to defend a lot of practices. By contrast, you can play around with these other options, right, and reach the position they did in Northern Europe, which permitted or maybe even blessed practices that seemed far the other way. And I think that, that is somewhat typical of this text that sort of stands in between a place of where you kind of work out ideas and articulate values and something that later becomes sort of a, a, a more precise guide to practice. Now, I want to close with something that is a little closer, I think, to our um, lives, and I think brings up uh, some of the questions, that, uh, some points that were asked before. So after this discussion, obviously our jump to the Middle Ages is not the Talmud itself. The Talmud tells the following story, a quasi story. And it says, Rabbi Yehuda said it in the name of Rabbi. There was an incident with a man who set his eyes on a certain woman. He became obsessed with her, such that the doctor said, he will not be healed unless she cohabits with him. And the sages said, let him die rather than cohabit with her. All right, so now we get the story. Because, and it's very abrupt, and I think we're going to talk a little bit about that abruptness. It kind of takes us to a very different place. Right? A guy becomes obsessed with a woman, that he's just got to cohabit with her, in other words, he's going to die. And they say, you know what? No dice. Now, 
Remember we said a ton is a layered text? Now the layers are going to come in. So now somebody, we don't know, suggests, well, okay, let her, uh, let her stand before him naked. And they say, no, he's going to die rather than stand before him naked. And they say, well, let her talk to him from behind a fence. And they say, no, he should die rather than converse with him behind a fence. So again, we've got this very extreme. In other words, it's basically asking, well, what's you know, what's the act? What's what's this is clearly in the adultery category. I'll say a second. So what's the problem? Okay, so what about some half measures, right? If 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 the only thing that's prohibited is you know actual adultery, can, and they say no this, and then they say, well, wait, is this woman married or not? And one opinion says, yeah, she was married. And then one says, no, she's unmarried. So then the says, okay, if she's married, I get it. But if she's unmarried, what are you talking about? <laughs> So it says, um, it basically says that the problem is that, well, you know, the woman's dignity is at stake here too. And you know, why should she become a tool for his problems? Well, they say, okay, fine, but why not marry her? She's single. And I guess they're assuming she's willing. And it says something, says, this would not have appeased his desire. And it states his verse from Proverbs, stolen waters are sweetest and the bread of secrecy most pleasant. Yeah. How did we get here? So one could say, well, it's talking about different types of sort of instances where you have to die rather than sit. OK, and that's certainly true. But the break is very jarring, and it takes us to a very different place. And here's my suggestion, that it says, look, all this talk about martyrdom and oppressors, right? To some sense, these are very what I would call scripted scenarios, right? These are fortunately rare. Even in Jewish life, they happen, but they're kind of rare. But they're fortunately rare and very extreme. But in the real world, how are people tested? In the real world, are people tested by people coming up with guns in the sense of do this or I'll kill you? No, I think that's the kind of philosophical model that we kind of use to test out the ideas. The real world, I think the Tom says, looks a lot more like this. Right? Looks a lot more like this guy. Oops. Looks a lot more like this guy <coughs> who became obsessed with a woman. Right? And felt that he had to sin. Now, how do you how do you become obsessed with a woman such that you know you're gonna die? Unless you, right? That's not something somebody does to you. That's something you do to yourself. And I think what's concluded, the reason they're so strict on him is to say, look, let's separate the issues, right? All this talk about someone forcing you, right? Sure, yeah, we got the rules for that. But that's not the real cases. The real cases are when you put yourself in that situation. In that case, you have to be very honest with yourself, with gut check. How did I get here? Am I truly coerced? Am I truly forced? Or did I kind of bring myself into this situation? I think the kicker, right, is that last line. When they say, okay, fine, so assuming that she's single, so marry her. And it's just, well, it wouldn't work. Well, why not? Because what he wants is to sin. And this is what I mean by the Talmud functioning not just as a legal document from where the rules are derived, but as a teaching document, where not just its content, but its form teaches, right? Where this contraposition of two very different scenarios in which one is coerced. One fully dominated by the external coercer. And the whole discussion is about who that is and how that works and what their motivations are. But then kind of flung immediately to this other story, which I would say is, is, is in some sense the real story here, right? Of really how we come to be coerced. That most often, right? We're coerced because we find ourselves in a situation. And in that sense, before you're going to start about coercion, you have to have an honest kind of gut check. <coughs> and if the answer is, well, because what you're after is sin, well, then the rules are going to be very different. So I think sort of to conclude, and I thought I'd show just another uh, video, two-minute video that they showed at this uh, event. It just shows you all the different places in the world where the, where the Thomas study goes on. So like, this is why this document is so central, right? Because it's doing a whole bunch of different things at once, right? It's both telling you what the rules are, but it's also engaging you into discussion of 
what's the rationale for them? What should they be? What are the different options? What are the debates? How are the different ways to think about it? And it's that process that stands at the core of the Jewish understanding of Torah study, which ultimately is, I think, the response to the loss of identity that took place in uh, the Holocaust. It's a little overproduced for my taste, but it's <laughs> bad it's only men so but it's nice that we have women here I think. Uh, yeah, yeah the truth is that's a large matter of debate yeah um, and uh, the outfit that produced that, that but there are plenty of women who do it mm. uh, I was gonna ask whether that was chosen deliberately to only show men that one was okay so so in other words you know from sort of a lot of sociology in other words the people who put that video together are what you call ultra orthodox right and they sort of oh, don't favor, at least don't favor publicly. All the, all the daughters of all the rabbis do, but I just <laughs> deny it. Um, in other circles... That's a great, that's this text, right? Yeah, right, yes. So there it is. Um, <laughs> in, in other circles, um, I would say, um, you know, it's been the last 30, 40 years that women have sort of come into it. So it's still not, I wouldn't say it's equal, but it's certainly getting there. Uh, the yeshiva I went to about five years ago opened a women's program that is on par with its men's program, which was a kind of big step. So I think it's definitely changing um, quite significantly. Mm -hmm. I know that students shut off after 60 minutes and they're all waiting to go. I don't want to stop them doing that. So uh, anyone, please feel free to go. And then anyone who wants to talk more, I'd be happy to. Yeah. Actually, can I ask you a question about this, this idea that's coming full circle? I know sure. that sometimes that coming full circle is that idea of um, Right at the end, we were talking about the, uh, the irreversibility that was early on that came up. 
Right. And I remember when I said that comment, I was thinking about that the, the results, the external results are irreversible. So when you murder someone, you can't unmurder them. Right. But actually, when you come back to the end of it, it's not, that's actually missing the point. The point is that the effects, the internal effects of the killer are irreversible. Of the murderer, you can't undo the fact that you murdered someone. And you can't undo the fact that you've committed adultery. And you can't undo the, uh, the effects of, of idolatry either. So it's not that anything external is irreversible, but that thing that might hold those three things together is that the effect of the perpetrator but are well, irreversible. Not, for example, why not Shabbat? In other words, one, one of the things that's interesting is that what's not on that list, right? So two things that aren't on that list, and yeah. they're interesting because in the book of Maccabees, which predates this, we talk about circumcision and Shabbat. Yeah. And the Talmud kind of bounces those around yeah. and says no. Um, so I think one of the interesting questions is not just what's on the list, but what's not on the list, particularly in light of the fact that we have pretty decent historical evidence that questions of circumcision and Shabbat uh, were very much on the agenda. And that's probably what that like vote is, in other words. Right. Like, there's some sort of formal process described there. To, and it seems to me that most commentators say that, that what they're doing is excluding those. Which, which then begins to sort of beg, well, you know, why? Because one can say that about any potential uh, sin, right? The other thing that they would say is, well, are you really in those, to what extent are you doing it when you're doing it under duress, right? Which, and there's right. a whole long discussion about yeah, that yeah. as well. Yeah. But the, the, oh, go ahead. Well, I just, uh, you mentioned about the process starting with the Crusades and ending with Auschwitz. Could you say anything more about the Auschwitz? side of this and how it might apply to some of the law? Gosh. Um, well, I think, I think sort of the way I started, which is I think you see why, though you know, no one in the Holocaust was given a choice, you know, do this or die, right. why it is that the community has understood them as martyrs. Because one kind of late motif is when you die for being a Jew, that murder, right? That comes very strongly uh, from the Talmudic, um, uh, from the Talmudic reasoning. And you know, whatever you're going to say about the Holocaust, they died for being Jewish. Um, so I think that's sort of um, where that that sort of view of, of, of the Holocaust as a sort of act of martyrdom comes from. In terms of the framing of European history, um, you know, that's obviously controversial, right? Because and one of the things, particularly in this audience, that was kind of like, how much of Christian anti-Semitism is there in the Holocaust? Um, and I think, you know, in a traditional sort of Jewish view, is a lot because it's it's sort of on the background of, of of something that starts with the Crusades and then has you know various high and low points, but almost at that's its terminal point. It's the only way to say it. Uh, I'm not sure what else you're asking, and if I'm the right person to talk to it. To it. No, that's what I was. I was thinking about in terms of the Holocaust, and which of course occurred in very different places, and whether the responses of the people who were murdered was somehow shaped by this. I do know that that uh, many of the most religious communities were the ones who ended up in the camps because they were the ones less likely to leave. Yeah. So I'm no expert on the Holocaust history, but uh, you know, I, I think that the numbers you're talking about, it was literally everybody. Um, you know, um, there weren't six million religious Jews in Europe, right? Um, there were you know, maybe two million. Um, so the, the, you know, the magnitude is just so enormous that at some point those decisions uh, become irrelevant. In you know, going on what individual people thought, of course we don't know. What I do know is that the way people have chosen to remember this is to tie it to this tradition really beginning in the Crusades of um, martyrdom for faith, though you could describe it very differently. Right? They didn't have a choice. It wasn't really about faith. But I think that it's this language um, in the in the Talmud that is sort of shaping very much uh, the response to it. And what are your options at that point? Well, no, I mean, and no, you're, 
No, I'm saying the, the, resp the, the response of the member. I know. I mean, in the wake of, of the Holocaust, what are your options as a community as far as how you interpret that? And I know that there's no one interpretation. There's no one. And, and, and look, another way to go, in other words, the way I was talking about it was the sort of, right, the, the contrary response to the way I framed it would have been Zionist. Mm. Right? In other words, uh, the way I chose to frame it was was a return to, to, the, to the core of the tradition, which was one response. Another very different response was a, a sort of political solution. And of course, you know, they both happened and are both there. So I think that mm -hmm. that that's a different way to go, mm -hmm. right? And then there's a whole other narrative about the state of Israel being the response to that, mm -hmm. which of course is also somewhat historically true. Right? Um, right. Um, so I think that's that's a very a very different way, but a different way but to think about it, but bring uh, different metaphors. Just as a footnote too, as a, that that the mothers killing babies is um, is also happened in other genocides too. It happened in Rwanda. It's happened in other cases where that is an act of uh, mercy, um, not and, and because you would much rather I would much rather kill my own child than allow them to be raped, disfigured, dismembered, you know, killed slow, you know, like all of it, which were realities. Sure. And I think that's where you get the it's tough with dealing with these philosophical ideas or these. You know, to have principles and the actual fact of what it is on the ground when it, when you're in sure. real persecution, real pogrom, real Holocaust, real yeah. genocide. That that's where there's a gap. Yeah, I think sometimes. And, and I think that if you read the medieval commentators, they're totally aware yeah. of that, right? Because because they're not going to say that's not okay. Right. But nor are they going to prescribe it as a exactly. practice, right? Yeah. So it exists in this gray zone uh, of exactly. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much.